located in a reconfigured factory building and near a busy metro stop in Moscow. The building, the ground floor of the building is a kind of shopping mall and there are different offices and some more stores on the upper floors. Uh, we are conveniently located just above the furniture store. You can see the sign that says Nebel right there in the middle. We have a small office and we have two full-time staff. See their names are Sergei Grushka and Natasha Zhuravyenkova. They are both convinced friends, and their stories of how they discovered Quakerism are really very interesting, and I don't think I have time to tell all of the stories here this morning. Uh, we have two monitors, a laptop, and a bunch of cell phones, and that is the center of a, really a very big network of seekers, allies, and friends in Russia and the former Soviet Union. It's, we're not a big operation. Natasha always says that's good because if you're small and poor, it gives you a certain kind of freedom. Nobody watches you all that carefully. <laughs> <laughs> Friends House is the result of a dream that goes back to the end of the First World War. The, during, at the end of the First World War, Quakers from Britain and the United States were involved in relief work in Russia, particularly in um, what is southeastern European Russia, where there were, was ter a terrible famine peaking in the years 1921 and 22. Americans and Brits, young people for the most part, quite young, some of them were left college to do this work, went there, got in food and medical supplies, got in shipments of clothing, worked with the Bolsheviks at times to the result that they were praised by Trotsky in public and in Pravda, and undoubtedly saved many lives. Some of them lost their own lives in the process. On your left is Viola Tillard, who was a British Quaker who died of typhus, which was <coughs> epidemic in those years after the war, and is buried in Moscow, in one of the cemeteries there. They tried to get her back to Moscow for better medical care, but she was too sick and she died. The, on your right up above is a postcard that British friends used to raise money for and stimulate interest in the relief work in Russia. And the, um, there is a film on our Friends House Moscow website that British Friends produced, a little black and white silent film that also shows you the AIDS workers, the town they worked in, some of the people they worked with. They were feeding and clothing people, particularly children. Children were dying. There are heart-rending <coughs> photographs of children dying on bunk beds in makeshift hospitals and clinics in this part of Russia in these years. They got, they organized local people and got the resources to do some work to, um, with drainage. A lot of the infrastructure had gone down during the war, the revolution, and the civil war. In this district of Russia, 100,000 or more people, there were no doctors left because they had all been drafted into the army during World War I. So they did this engineering work to try to get better irrigation and drainage to reduce malaria, which was also a pestilence in the area. The rather dark photograph on the right, so this, this is the kind of service end of Quakers in Russia after World War I. And it was this service, by the way, that brought to birth the American Friends Service Committee. The American Friends Service Committee's history begins with this work in Europe 
Eastern Europe, and including Russia at the end of the First World War. It was a transformative experience for Quakers to be involved in this work. In the bottom, a rather dark photograph of a bright pink building in Moscow was the original Moscow Friends House. This is the second half of the work of, of Quakers in Russia after World War I. There was the relief work. There was also an attempt to establish a meeting place. After World War I, Quakers tried to create friends' houses in different cities in different parts of Europe. They still exist. There's one in London, for example. Um, there's one in Paris. There's one in Brussels. And there is, we're, we're the one in Friends House. It was originally located in this very beautiful looking glowing pink stucco and cement building. Um, and it's all continued to operate as a center for worship, a center for uh, hospitality, and a center for information until 1931. It was the long, it was the foreign religious organization that lasted longest in Russia after Stalin's takeover. And in 31, there was one lone, valiant Irish friend who was kind of holding on, but she had to go back home to get her visa. And she, they didn't grant her a new visa. So that was the end of the Friends House Center. So what we are today is a small organization trying to, uh, you're trying to, try to re rebirth these two aspects of peace work and Quakerism in Russia. If, yeah. Um, how did you get involved with this work? Then? Why don't I wait till the end and you, then I can I tell that, because that becomes, yeah, as I said, there's too many stories for, for, for one hour. Um, the uh, the um, different kinds of service projects, the Friends House Moscow was recreated in a couple, in meetings of international Quakers in 1992 and 93, after the fall of the communist system. There were already some worship groups meeting in Russia. One Russian historian and translator discovered Quakers through her work in English, researches in English history. Her name was Tatanya Pavlova. She turned up at worship in Philadelphia one morning and she introduced herself as a Russian Quaker and I was like, oh my God, you know, a door is opening. She was an international friend, um, and her flat in Moscow became a center for worship, and it was kind of the seed of the Moscow monthly meeting. There is a monthly meeting in Moscow. Uh, there are three separate worship communities now in Moscow. How do we continue the work that was begun? How do we continue peace work in Russia? First of all, we do it with a network of allies. You know, not everybody who is drawn to the peace testimony is a Quaker. After world, the fall of communism, Russia's new post-Soviet constitution guaranteed a right to conscientious objection on the basis of religious or philosophical objection to war. And it offered alternative civilian service for these people for those who had these kinds of strong feelings. It's interesting to go back to Russia's history and notice that at the, when the Bolsheviks took over, they created a conscientious objection possibility. And Russian, there are a fair number of Protestants in Russia, and there were back in the 1920s. Mennonites in the Ukraine, for example, and South Russia received alternative service grants as a result of these new laws. Again, after Stalin kikes over, that's all gone. But there were people being COs and getting exemptions for military service in Russia up through the 1920s. Um, this is a little newspaper called the Alternativschik, and it is for alternative servicemen. And we have subsidized the printing and distribution of this paper. It's now going all online. This is a picture from it. 
uh, of its headline and we sent out about a thousand copies every year and they went mostly to churches. In Russia there are Baptists and Jehovah's Witnesses and the Russian Baptists are conscientiously opposed to war. So a lot of the people who pursued CO status were from that popu particular population. There were also people who were just seekers. Fine, they read Gandhi or Tolstoy, and they decided that they could not serve in the army. Um, and they also benefited by this. Every year in Russia, there are, you know, maybe 700 or 800 people who claim alternative service status. The government is not eager for people to find out that this possibility exists. So getting the word out is part of what we do. And here are two stories about two people who were helped by a couple who work in partnership with Friends House Moscow. They don't live near a meeting, however, they consider themselves pacifists, Quakers, and anarchists. They're a remarkable couple. I'm grateful that I've had the chance to meet them. The boy on the left, oh, it's, we'll start with the fellow on the right. His name is Artyom. He was not a CO. Artyom ex enlisted voluntarily. Russia has a draft, and under the draft, really a lot of people, a lot of young men get exemptions. If you're a university student, you're exempted. The result is that only young men from poorer families end up getting drafted or volunteering for the army. Artyom is from a poor family in the big city of Kazan, and his mother is a single mom with two other children, and he volunteered for the army. Um, the boy on the left, his name is Khalid. Khalid is a high school student. And Russian high school students are now required to do a kind of life skills course which includes military preparedness. The military in Russia is get moving into the schools the same way it is doing and trying to do in the United States, like junior ROTC and the gifts of computers that, the, that this army makes to American public schools. Okay, uh, Khalid decided he would, wasn't going to go to summer camp. He said, it's beautiful in May. Why should I waste my time playing war games? Mm -hmm. So we uh, went to work to help him. There he is again, and there on your right, they're pretty dark, are photographs of Russian children in a military preparedness camp. Uh, and if you see, can see the photographs at all, there's a little girl, a little boy, and neither of them look like they're too eager to learn how to f fire AK-47s, which is what someone's teaching them to do. There is, it's, so it's now in the schools, and there are these summer camps that you can send your child to, and it'll, it'll teach him or her military skills. Um, Khalid refused. And his teachers started to threaten him. They said they were going to you know, mess up his permanent record. They were going to put him down as failing subjects if he didn't do this. He dug his heels in. The school called for, sent for a meeting for him and his parents, and they scared his parents half to death. They said to him, you know, you have to, you have to do this. They're saying that they'll, you, they won't give you your diploma if you don't. At this point, he got in touch with a man named uh, Germán, and Germán and his wife Nina are the people who work with Friends House Support to try to help young men like this. And uh, they went into action, and basically they got it all delayed. They went to the ombudsman for children in the region. They went higher up in the educational system and argued that he could not be forced to do this. Everybody, they finally, the school backed off. A lot of these things are won by, not by formal decisions, but it's a kind of dance. Authority pushes. Other families push, and with the aid of human rights workers, push back, and it goes like this. So Khalid didn't have to go to summer camp and learn how to you know, clean and fire an AK-47. 
militarization of childhood. We're seeing it in this country, and you see it in Russia too. These I picked up from the internet. One on the left is a baby's costume that you can buy for your baby. See, it's a marine cap and some camo trousers. On your right, the same thing in Russia. It's a baby, it's called a military costume for babies. So that the it, it, education, um, the childhood itself is under threat in both of our countries. Um, both the United States and Russia, this is sort of my little aria, suffer from a great many of the same so social and spiritual ills. It's the hangover from the Cold War. Back to Artyom. Artyom volunteered, and he was on his way to his first post. See on the left some kids. There, there are kids, most of them are about 18 or 19 and they're getting on the train to go to their first post. Artyom was on the train going to his first post and the other soldiers threw him off the train. S savage bullying is a fact of life in the Russian army, which is one reason why families really don't want their sons to go in. There have been horrific cases of boys bullied, usually by the old, older soldiers. You know, they make them do chores for them. They beat them up if they won't. I, I've met young men who have been through this um, and kind of gritted their teeth and put up with it in most cases. Um, okay, so they threw him off the train. The, his mother got a visit from a couple of people from the local draft board, and they told her her son was in a hospital about 2,000 miles away near the border of Mongolia and had been there for a week. She got on the internet and she got in touch with our friends, German and Nina, and they went to work. They got, first of all, they got, got her money for a train ticket to go see her son in the hospital. And then they pursued, they got her a reliable lawyer. And the lawyer pursued, with the aid of the couple we know, got this boy his discharge got him a referral for a special hospital for rehabilitation in Moscow. His, he had some bad, he had a fractured skull and spinal injuries. Mm -hmm. um, and also he had a broken, he also had a broken arm. So he, he was, he, they, they were bullying him. Nobody, nobody, they tried to get, the lawyer tried to get people to testify. And the army's line was, nobody saw that happen, so it didn't happen. And then the army's line was, he's, the boy's trying to desert. He should go to jail. But in the end, he got his discharge and he got a disability pension. And you see him there. In the photo, you see his mother. He's sitting down. His younger brother's there. And to the right is Nina, who is the activist who works with her husband to help people who are trying to either become COs or who are in the army and are being treated illegally. Um, uh, I, I, one American Quaker who spent a lot of time in Russia once said, he's an activist, she's a force of nature. <laughs> I mean, she really will do anything she can to help these families out. Um, again, bullying. On your left is a Russian cartoon showing an older soldier, you know, uh, making the kids, the new, the new conscripts, polish his shoes. He's got his foot propped on the back end of one of them. And on the right is an American cartoon. You know, women serving in the American armed forces are much more likely to be raped by other soldiers than they are to die in combat. You know, you know, the, the internal culture of armies is a violent culture. The earliest Quakers knew that, um, and it's, it's still true today. Anti-war sentiment in Russia, it's always been fascinating to me that um, Russians don't buy into it quite, so it's a whole idea of military glory, quite as easily as Americans do. Um, that's changing because the, the Second World War, you know, the, the Good War, is, is really the kind of uh, a unifying story in Russia. Um, but still, I've been in a train station and there are kids marching through in their new uniforms and the Russians are looking at each other and sighing and saying, oh, the poor boys. 
You know, they, they know that, 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 you know, that, that just to be in the army is dangerous. Um, there are very active groups in Russia that support uh, soldiers getting right treatment. One of them is called the Union of the Mothers of Soldiers. It was formed during their war in Afghanistan, which we've now taken on. Um, and uh, it was fa women founded it demanding that the government tell them what was going on. You know, they weren't finding out if their sons or brothers or husbands had been wounded or killed. You know, a coffin lined with zinc so, the body, so you wouldn't notice the smell so much would show up in somebody's hometown. And they would have no way of finding out what had happened. Um, so they became very active pursuing the rights of soldiers. Like us, Rose Russians just want a government that follows and respects its own laws. And theirs doesn't. Um, the on your right is a, an anti-war demonstration. In, uh, it was on, it was on um, one of the anniversary days for World War II. And there, the woman in red is standing in a field, in a, it's a memorial garden near St. Petersburg. And she's dressed in red and raising her hand. She's posed, that's a famous Russian World War II propaganda pose. It says, the motherland is calling you. So she's doing that. But what she's holding is a sign that says, say, speak up when you've had enough. And lying on the ground are young men who are volunteers who are you know, playing dead. So it's, it was a kind of action filmed and photographed as a protest against continuing wars in Russia. And this one was really kind of a lot of fun. It was the clowns. The battle cruiser Aurora is, is, was an old uh, warship and it supposedly fired the shot that started the Russian Revolution. So, the, the, during, in 1917, on the anniversary of the start of the Russian Revolution, these anti-war activists took over the Aurora. I mean, they were chased off again pretty quickly, but they weren't arrested because they were clowns. One of them is holding a sign that says they don't arrest clowns. Another one is holding a sign that says clowns for the protection of traditional values. And another one is holding a sign that says, we've got to have enemies. Hmm. Some of the same, it's again, it's the thinking that, that, that makes people receptive to wars. Um, Russians are not passive. People have the idea that they are. They're not. Protesting is very, much more dangerous there than it is here. <coughs> but there have been substantial protests. Um, these were in September. And there have been anti-war protests. There have been protests against the corruption of their uh, electoral processes. Those protests tend to be confined to the big cities. And the participants, a lot of them are really young. They're like teenagers. Older Russians say they, they act like they're not afraid of the police. The police tell them to disband and they keep right on going and the police beat them up and they still keep right on going. And it, it's been, it, it's really extraordinary to see some of this. Um, one of the things that's been going on in Russia is that they are raising the retirement and uh, pension, like Social Security age. They're raising it to an age that makes it statistically likely that if you're a Russian man, you won't live long enough to get your old age pension. Um, and there have been a lot of protests against this. And these were in Moscow. They were all over the country. There were thousands of people demonstrating in, in dozens of cities. Um, and there were more than 1,000 people arrested. The one on your right, it's a little dark, but you see a very old woman holding a picture of Putin. It says, no. Um, on your left is a group of young people demonstrating in um, Moscow. And there, the sign says, I want to live till retirement age. Um, and on the right, uh, in Moscow, a little hard to see, but they're, they're, the police are beating up those demonstrators. See the white figure? 
she's very noticeable. She was in the photos because she was wearing a white kind of suit and the policeman's knocked her down and it's, he's got a truncheon in his hand and he's gonna beat her. Uh, there were a big outcry in social media about this in Russia. Social media are very powerful there. News is censored. There's only one independent TV station operating in Russia. You know, there are web sources, but social media, Facebook and a more European social media platform called the Kontaktia are very, very popular and very influential. That's how people organize. Uh, Anti-war, anti anti-violence. Alternatives to Violence Project is very active in Europe and has been very popular in Russia. Do you, you all know the program? Yeah. Okay. It was founded in the United States by Quakers working in the New York State prisons after the riots in Attica. Um, some of the people who founded it are still around, and, and one of them is a member of my meeting, in fact, Chuck Esser. Um, it became, it is a very experiential conflict resolution program. It, very, it, it tends to appeal very strongly to young people. And there have been active AVP trainings in Russia, in some of the Kafkaz countries. It's been, it's been very popular in Georgia. And it is very active right now in Ukraine. Friends House Moscow for years had a real partnership with um, a AVP and school mediation training programs in one town, Odessa, in Ukraine. It goes back years. What Friends House Moscow does is we, you know, we don't have a lot of money, we don't have a lot of staff. We don't just give money, we form relationships. And some of the people we partner with, we've been partners with for years. Um, the AVP Odessa group, I don't know, that's a relationship that goes back to the uh, probably about year 2000 or so for Friends House. Um, after the Biden and after the start of the conflict in U Eastern Ukraine, some of the AVP trainers were invited to Kiev to work with the protesters on Maiden Square because they were getting so burned out. And they came in and the Maiden, most of them were Russian speaking Ukrainians. And they came in and they were confronted by some of the other people who were Ukrainian speakers saying, what are you doing here? You're from Odessa, what do you know about what's going on here? And they sat down and said, you need to tell us. And they told them. And they, the, they, went, they were invited to go back and they formed, there's some new AVP trainers in Kiev and new AVP training programs have started in several other places in Ukraine. And we have been involved in sponsoring them, helping them get some money. Um, a lot of what we do, in fact, is just let people know that this is going on and we try and get, the, and we act as a kind of conduit. Some cute pictures on your left, a little boy from uh, an AVP training session. He's, he's drawing a picture of a soul house. And do you see that his soul house has no boundaries? There's the door and it says open. But you know, the whole piece of paper and everything beyond the piece of paper is his soul. And we are all welcome to enter in. Um, also, just one of the brights and kids doing one of the team work and balance exercises that AVP does. And down at the bottom is alternatives to violence training in the Army. Believe it or not, in Russia and Ukraine, people who work with AVP have been invited to come into Army units to do trainings because some of the commanders and some of the psychologists are so worried about bullying. It was real short-lived in Russia. We had a couple of programs and they didn't last because you know, the psychologist got transferred to another post. And the new commanding officer didn't want anything to do with this weird stuff. Um, and he was worried about how it would look on his resume. So that was the end of that. 
but right there's ADP is now working with the Ukrainian National Guard, and those are a bunch of Ukrainian you know, soldiers who are doing ADP exercises. I've had my doubts about this because I thought, well, it's team building. Is it going to make the soldiers work together more efficiently to follow orders? And some of the Russians I know say no. They believe that the horizontality of AVP Ukraine is so strong that it will not be co-opted. Um, and also some of the reports that you get in, it's interesting because the, the guys who did these trainings in Ukraine, some of them said things like, now I, I, we got to know each other better, now I feel like I have some friends in my outfit. But they also say is it makes you more aware of the other people around you, but it also makes you more aware of yourself and what you want and what's important to you. So you know, these trainings tend to have, it seem to have the effect of promoting self-awareness, which is a very good thing. And, and I think it doesn't uh, tend to make, you know, self-aware people are not likely to obey orders without thinking. Ukraine. Um, It's a horrible and complicated story. Um, this is a sh just a photo. It's a shell, and it's landed. You see the playground in the background. The fighting in Ukraine is going on in people's backyards. It's been going on now for four years. Ten thousand people have been killed, and over three million people have been displaced. About half of them went to Russia, and the other half went to Western Ukraine, and in some cases to Poland. Um, so that one of the things AVP has done in Ukraine is to work with displaced persons who are now in the West, who came from the East. A lot of children were displaced. Sometimes they just arrive at a camp in Western Ukraine not knowing where their parents were. Um, and the part of, they've, they've worked to integrate these kids into local schools and been successful enough that when the kids moved into permanent <coughs> apartments from these kind of summer camps that were being used as uh, housing for DPs, the, they'd ask the AVP people to come with them to their new schools so that they seeded some AVP projects in some schools in towns in Ukraine that have seen a lot of, of refugees. I got here. <coughs> Wars make refugees. Um, one of the oldest partnerships Friends House Moscow has w is with a group that is sometimes called the Refugee School. They've gone through several inaugurations. They have been under pressure politically. They work with refugees. And here is a recent photograph of a group of young people around a table with some of the volunteers and staff from the center, the refugee school. Um, they are making a map of Moscow. And it's a map, it's interesting, it sort of shows where they all live and where the center is and where their schools are. But I saw a close up of the map, photo of the map at one point and it also was marked with places where the skinheads hung out. You know, where you didn't want to go if you were a brown skinned person. And also, it sort of things about where the, the metro stops, where the police were more likely to roust you or start demanding you to see your passport. And the Russian police do pick on you know, non European looking people. I've seen them do it. I, you know, they, there's some guy who's, you know, Central Asia somewhere probably, and they pull him aside and they're checking his papers and he's standing there looking like this. You know, afraid that they'll find something or pretend to find something wrong. Um, racism in Russia is real. It's not doesn't look the same as it does here, but um, Russia's high rates of incarceration are go hand in hand with racism, like they do in this country, and they go hand in hand with really strict and capriciously enforced drug laws. I mean, I know we, we have a connection who works in prison visitation. 
And he said, at 2 in the morning, he gets a call from the Uzbek consulate saying they've got a couple of Uzbek guys. They say they have drugs. The guys insist they were planted. And off he goes to see what he can do to at least get these people some honest <laughs> lawyers to help them when they're in this pickle. Um, Mo, where, Russia doesn't take very many refugees at all. You know, we're not taking as many as we used to, and certainly not as many as we should. They take very few. Um, the refugees that we first, the refugee school started, at that Friends House Moscow was operating out of the basement of a church um, in about 1993 and 4. And somebody, one of the British friends, was working as a volunteer with this refugee program, and they said, we don't have anywhere to go, you know, the lease is up, the rent's going up, and she said, well, we've got more room than we use. So the refugee school and Friends House Moscow were in the basement of the same church together. So the relate connection goes back years. Um, originally, the refugees were from the Chechen War. And this is a photograph of the city of Grozny after Russia bombed it into non-existence. Um, the Chechen War. Um, you know, those, were, those were a lot of refugees, and they helped them. And it was a little bit dangerous because Chechens tended to be seen as terrorists. In the beginning, a lot of Russians were really sympathetic to Chechen demands for autonomy or even indep national independence. But after terrorist attacks, which some Russians believe were staged by their own government to justify continuing the war, Right. Russia, if you like conspiracy theories, Russia's a place for you. <laughs> and face it, a lot of conspiracy theories have turned out to be true in relation to what goes on in Russia. Um, now there are very few Chechens. Uh, Chechen, it, Chech, Russia poured a lot of money into Chechnya. They rebuilt the city of Grozny. Um, and the country is now run by a man who considers Putin like a father to him, mm -hmm. uh, Kadyrov, he has a terrible human rights record, but things are, very, are peaceful in Chechnya. Um, they did a purge of gay men, by the way, about two years ago, and the Kadyrov, they were, gay men were being rounded up, beaten up, threatened, um, a lot of them fled the country, and Kadyrov was saying, well, it's ridiculous that we're, we're mistreating gay men because there aren't any gay men in Chechnya. Chechen men are real men, unlike you know, other kinds of men. Um, and there were Russians. The LGBT movement in Russia is very, stays very low under the radar. Um, but there are LGBT groups. They're very more active than you might think, and so many of them are very courageous. And so they've had safe houses in Moscow, and they were helping these men lie low in Moscow till they could arrange for them to get safe passage and, uh, and uh, refugee status in European countries. There were, it was even kept secret which countries were offering these men status because they were so afraid of retribution against their families back home in Chechnya. That was the heartbreaking part of those interviews. That these Chechen guys who've been left for Chechnya, their own family members are threatening to kill them because they're homosexual, are still saying things like, I miss my family so much, I can't bear it, I don't want them to have any trouble because of me. So family love is, is a very powerful, but sometimes very complicated thing. Uh, Present-day refugees, um, the little boy in the bottom is from Congo, the boys on the left, I don't know where they are, it's very likely they're from, they're from Afghanistan, but I don't know a story there. The girl on the top is a Syrian. Um, what this refugee school does is they have about 80 kids and they help them do school readiness. Um, they give them Russian lessons, they give them educational supports, um, they offer some supports for their families, and in some, they also give some legal support in terms of access to schools. 
Any kid who's got a family have an address in Moscow is entitled to go to a Moscow school. But some of the heads of some of the schools have been going to families who are Uzbeks or you know, Bashkirs and saying, let me see your address again. This doesn't look right to me. You'd better take your kid out of this school until we can get this settled. So they're, they're, they're getting pushed out. It's, they have rights, but you, you know, it's surprisingly easy for somebody to make it hard for you to exercise your rights. Um, so we have funded them for years, um, and they, they're perfectly legal. Everything we do is perfectly legal under Russian law. But they have trouble finding landlords who are willing to rent to them because they've got so many foreign and black skinned and brown skinned and yellow skinned kids and families hanging around the place. Chechen war. Um, there were Russians, there were Russia's first big peace demonstration that wasn't organized by the Communist Party, was a protest against Russia's involvement in the war in Chechnya. This is one of the Moscow Monthly Meeting members. He's holding very proudly, proud Papa here. It's a story he wrote and his daughter, who was then in her teens, illustrated it. It was published in a book which contains stories in English, Russian, and now Chechen, selected by school children from those three different cultures, and illustrated by children from those three different cultures. Any of you ever run into a friend named Janet Riley? Her husband, Toby Riley, uh, lives in one of the Friends Retirement Centers in New Jersey. Um, Janet lives in uh, Sandy Springs now, but she was a member at Central Philadelphia. This was her project. She was in Russia teaching English to high school students, and they liked some stories. She found them about people doing good things. So she got some of them translated. And this man, Misha Roshtin, helped her find uh, Chechen translators and connections with Chechen school teachers. The story he wrote is about his life-changing encounter with an older Russian man who set up a prayer tent in a public square in Moscow during the Chechen, first Chechen war, that's 93, 94, um, and fasted. And Misha joined him. And he said it was extraordinary how people came to them and told them they were so grateful they were doing this. And they made it very clear this is a religious vigil of, of for peace and against any war. Um, education, languages. Um, one of the other longtime partners Friends House has is a group called Big Change when the communist system fell apart. And you know, it was, it was terrible for people who lived through that. It was, it was a world. And you know, Russians, I, I, I have Russian friends who say, you know, it, it isn't that things were so great under communism, but we knew where you were. And you could get, you, you could go to the dentist. Your kids, kids could go to summer camp. There were social supports. And now, so much of that has been privatized. You know, Russians have seen their social network, it, well, it fell apart and then it was partly rebuilt and now it's crumbling again. They're taking money out of not just pensions for old people, but out of medical and educational parts of their budget to pay for the war in Ukraine. Um, this is why we're, the big change was a group of teachers and school psychologists who, after communism fell apart, said things to each other like, this is a whole new world. You know, things, yeah, people have to be differently prepared for this new world. And they were particularly concerned with what are called orphans in Russia. Um, in Russia, any child whose parents have lost custody is called a social orphan. Like if you're a single mother and, you're, uh, and, you've, and you get arrested, your children will be taken from you and made social orphans. And 
it's very hard for you to get custody back and you may not know that you can even have a right to get custody back. We actually helped with one program to educate parents who had lost custody about their rights and how they could regain custody of their children. Um, so these social orphans live often in orphanages, which are really very deadening and impersonal places, even if they're not, you know, brutally cruel. And at 16, they are released to live on their own, and they're given access to an apartment and um, a kind of disabilities allowance. Because a lot of them do have disabilities. Um, many of them have learning problems, some of them are physically disabled. And these teachers realized that these people, nobody was teaching them. They, they may have had some formal education, but they didn't know how to get around the city. They'd never been to a museum or to a concert. So they created a system of what's, really it's not so much education as life skills for young people who were social orphans. And many of them are young people who have disabilities. Um, and we've been partnered with them for years. It's an amazing program and they have been really successful in getting donations. I went to their, they had an anniversary when I was in Moscow this fall and I went um, and it, it was really kind of fun. And, and, uh, but they had a tree on the wall made out of paper with construction paper and pictures and it was a tree that showed all the fruits of their work and the fruits were their donors. And you know, they had uh, Citibank gives money, Sony gives them money. Their director is somebody who really went out and went to <coughs> corporations and said, we are doing this, nobody else is doing it, we want your help. And at first, the big donors said, show us your track record. What have you got? What can you show us? At the beginning, they'd say, well, not much. Uh, you know, we've got some, the basement of a building and that's it. At this, uh, they have now been ex in existence for 20 years, and at their anniversary celebration, I got up and said I was, you know, one of the Friends House Moscow board, and I was been here before, and it's always wonderful to be there because the atmosphere is so warm and friendly, which it is. Um, and the woman, one of the women administrators, got up and said, "I'm glad you're here because I want everybody to know that Friends House Moscow helped us before we had any any statistics to show anyone." So that's what yeah, you know, Quakers seem to be better at starting things, and they are carrying through on them. And this is a good example of it. But we're still connected, and we get them a little money every year for the English club. And the English club meet, and they read stories, and they practice conversational skills in English, and there you see they're drinking tea. <laughs> and it's in the top. Russians drink a lot of tea, too. And you know, it was this I found the last time I was in the building, and I loved it. It was a big, you know, those murals kids make out of uh, shelf paper, brown paper, and they painted on it, and it was the world of big change. And in the world of big change, there are many interesting places. Um, and one of them was the English club. It's the English club at the bottom and a detail. And you see who came to have tea. Is it clear enough? Smoking a pipe? Sure, it looks to me like Sherlock Holmes. It's Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes came for tea with the English club. <laughs> As hanging around, they always have art by the children on display. And that's always just wonderful to see. Pat, you want me to remind you of the time? Okay, good. How are we doing? Mm. Yeah. Okay, too slow. Um, okay, connections, outreach. We've, I've shown you now the, some of the service work that we do or support. Again, we don't do these things on our own. We have partnerships. We, we try to build relationships, not just give people money. Um, five years ago, we got a grant to do some systematic translations of Quaker literature into Russian. We'd done some, but it was pretty piecemeal. And this made it possible for us to be much more intentional about publishing. And it made it possible for us to do outreach in a way we'd never done before. We've published you know, now a dozen books 
and dozens of articles. We have also infiltrated Russian Wikipedia, and you'll probably find more information about Quakers there than you do on the English one. It's, you know, our, our director thought this was, you know, He's infiltrating he's, he, the, the uh, Russian uh, the, the information system in Russia. Our books. Um, the one on the left is a cover of a translation into Russian of a book called Norway Diary. One of the British friends got stranded in Norway when the Germans invaded it. And this is her diary. Um, she was involved with helping Jews escape. She was involved with the publication of some underground informational letters. Um, and the illustration for the cover, which is a really nice drawing, was done by a young man who worked as, for Friends House as he was opposed, a CEO, and he worked for us, and he's an artist. He's actually made a bit of a reputation for himself as an illustrator, and he did this for us, which is really a very nice cover. On your right, um, a translation of a book by a British friend called Diana Francis called um, Beyond War and Pe Rethinking War and Peace. Um, it's actually a book which is a very practical book about why war is outdated and what can be, you know, how conflicts can be handled in other ways. So there's the cover. We did it in paper. Most of our stuff's online, but we did this some, we do some in paper. And we sent 60 copies to St. Petersburg to the organization, the Mothers of Russian Soldiers. And they thanked us and asked for more. It, so these things are getting to people who have an interest in the damage that war can do to, to, uh, to, to us rather than just to our enemies. And um, you know, a, a, a dream come true was our website. We, a director at Friends House had been lecturing the board for years on you know, how we had to get up to speed with the web. And we opened, it's not three years ago, a Russian language Quaker website, and it's really good. It's quakers.ru, and this is just a screenshot I took of it. Um, we have uh, changing stories, translations, uh, books. There's an online in, uh, an internet library, and it's, um, it does very well. We, it gets about 40 visitors a day, and many of them return, and we know from the amount of time that they spend that they're not there by mistake. You know, they're, they're staying there for minutes, which means they're reading something, maybe downloading something. And we also have I'm back for a minute. We also have um, Facebook pages. We have a, an English language Facebook page, which is kind of my thing. It's what I do for the organization. And it's really like a little mini news feed about Quakers and Friends House, but it's also about human rights things and peace work in Russia. Um, the current story, I just found it and liked it. It's about an old woman who was it's a report from a human rights worker about the rights of the elderly and how an old woman in her hometown was being deprived of her rights by the city authorities. And the, it starts, the, the old woman came into a human rights clinic in her public library and said, what have they done with our government? Which I thought was just wonderful. And she went on to explain to them that the city was supposed to do repairs in her apartment, and instead they trashed it, and she couldn't get any satisfaction. And she, lawyers' fees were eating up her pension, which is pitifully inadequate for living anyhow. Um, so we have the English language one. If you're on Facebook, just look at Friends House Moscow. We also have a Russian language closed Facebook discussion group, and there are about 200 people on it. I mean, they're not all equally active, but there they are. And we have a second social uh, network page on a net, on a, it's called the Kontaktia, and it's popular in Russia and in Europe generally. We are opening a new web page, which will be where the new alternative chic newspaper goes. So it'll be a special page for information about those interested in seeking alternative service. Um, one of the results of our outreach work has been, uh, one of the results of our virtual relationships has been for helping form some new ones. 
People who meet, find out about us online turn up in Moscow. We had a visitor from a town in Siberia last week. He'd been, he did, he had connected with friend's house online and he was in Moscow and he came into the office and spent the day visiting with our two staff members. Um, online, we have promoted a group that's called Medi Meditation in the Manner of Friends. If any of you know Rex Ambler's light meditation process, it's a kind of guided meditation. We don't call it prayer or meeting for worship, but people found, we, we advertised it online, and now they meet um, usually in our office every two weeks, and there are usually you know, eight, 10 people show up, and they take copies of books we have. But this is one of the most interesting events. The first ever Quakers Inquirers Weekend was held in Ukraine in September. And it was organized by Friends House Moscow using contacts that we have formed on social networks. In Russia, social media are really important because the news is not only censored, it's, it's distorted. Um, you know, it, it, it's, and so people form relationships online and they trust those as sources of information, which isn't always a good thing either but it, it, it's very active and it's very important for Russians. That's how a lot of people find out about CO stuff uh -huh. online. Uh -huh. Okay, so here we have a meeting in Kiev. There were, about 20, there were 27 or 28 people. It was run by the uh, European arm of FWCC, and there was a British Quaker, and uh, she's, uh, what is it, she's Swedish, a Swedish Quaker who ran it, and um, there were people there from Russia, from Poland, from Ukraine, and from Georgia. And the kind of great thing from Friends House stayed in the background because these other nationalities and nations have legitimate fears of Russian imperialism. And a lot of the protests and, and, and conflicts in Ukraine have focused around language, which is sort of strange because really, you know, most people in Ukraine are bilingual in both Ukrainian and Russian. The two languages are really very similar. Um, but Ukraine announced uh, a few years back that mandatory, that you, know, you wouldn't be able to, the schools wouldn't conduct classes in Russian anymore. It would all be Ukrainian, which was very distressing for Russian speakers. So we stayed back, and the um, people who were running the group said, well, first we need to think about what languages we want to use. You can use, use the language of your preference, and we have translators here for Russian, Ukrainian, and English. And everybody talked about it for a while, and they decided that they'd all go with Russian because it was the most, it was the practical choice. Which I, 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 I you know, you see me getting, it's wonderful that people have gotten beyond some of those historic wounds to say, well, most of it, we all know Russian anyhow, so let's just use Russian. It, it means that there may be a new point in terms of peaceful relationships among the different countries of the former Soviet Union. And um, one good model for that is Russia and Germany. German Quakers have been very active in Friends House. There are only about 200 of them, but they really have been very supportive. Um, and one of the German friends once said, we have a special relationship because both of our countries suffered from, so terribly from the war which we inflicted on each other and ourselves. <clears throat> so it may be that some, there may be that feeling of you know, people recovering from a total, shared totalitarian experience there too. Now on the left, the woman in the, in the flower dress is a Ukrainian. She's a child psychologist who works with ADP. Uh, the man, tall man, is a Russian. He lives in Moscow. He's a psychologist. And the man on the right, I don't know, but he's from Poland. So there you, there you go. You have three of the nations of the former Soviet Union having tea and talking about how to live peacefully in a peaceful world. <laughs>